So uh, in general, the Schrodinger equation is difficult to solve. And we introduce here an uh, approximate method called perturbation theory. So the idea is to take the uh, Hamiltonian for a problem that is known, like for example the hydrogen atom, and then add to it a perturbation uh, that we take to be small and write down a Hamiltonian now that contains a correction term to it. So here, this operator with a hat on is the Hamiltonian for the perturbed problem, and we're showing it as the sum of the Hamiltonian for the unperturbed uh, problem. And then lambda is a parameter that uh, is meant to indicate that a very small uh, correction is made corresponding to the perturbed Hamiltonian. So the way that this problem is set up then is to assume that the uh, new eigenenergy, so this is shown here as this En for the uh, nth eigenstate, is equal predominantly uh, to the unperturbed eigenenergy for the nth state, plus a small correction, and so on higher terms. Ditto with the wave function, the perturbed wave function is taken to be the unperturbed uh, wave function and then added to it a small amount of some new uh, wave function. If we take this, um, this series of energies and wave functions and plug them into the Schrodinger equation and then collect together all the terms in first order we end up with the uh, modified Schrodinger equation you see on the slide. Of course, there are corrections that can be made by including terms of higher order, but we'll work with terms in first order, and this is called first order perturbation theory. Now, notice that the um, infinite set of eigenstates, remember the uh, eigenstates, for example, for the particle in a box, can run from n equals 1 to infinity, uh, they form a what is called a complete orthonormal set. Rather like sines and cosines in Fourier theory, uh, the equations that satisfy a Schrodinger equation can be used uh, to express uh, any other uh, type of function uh, if you sum them together with appropriate weighting coefficients. They have a couple of other properties that we haven't uh, mentioned explicitly and we will do so now. So if we take um, two eigen uh, functions uh, of a Schrodinger equation, for example corresponding to the n equal 1 and n equal 2 states for a particle in a box, let's call that psi n and psi m, and we look at this integral. If you remember we can write this integral over all space using Dirac notation much more easily this way. The eigenfunctions of the Schrodinger equation have the following property. <clears throat> well, this delta function here means that if n is equal to m, this integral is 1 because the wave functions were normalized. If you remember one of the exercises to work, was to work out the coefficient in terms of the particle in front of the particle in a box wave functions that made this so. But on the other hand, if this is n equal to m, for n not equal to m, this overlap is zero. So this is an important property of eigenfunctions of the Schrodinger equation, and it's what allows them to be used as a basis set to express any other function. So here I'm just showing that in general you can make some linear combination of these functions of the unperturbed uh, Hamiltonian to make new wave functions. So if you expand um, wave functions used for the perturbed uh, solution of the perturbed Hamiltonian in terms of the wave functions for the unperturbed Hamiltonian and insert them into this modified Schrodinger equation here, the result you get then is that the expression to first order for the perturbed energy of the system is just the perturbed Hamiltonian, but evaluated between the unperturbed uh, eigenstates of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. 
So a very simple result then that lets you use uh, your known eigenfunctions of the known Hamiltonian to evaluate the corrected energy in the presence of the perturbation uh, included here in this modified Hamiltonian. The expression for the modified wave functions to first order and of course of the unmodified wave function added to it though is a component of the other eigenstates uh, for the atom. These are weighted by this matrix element here which is the unperturbed nth state operated on by the Hamiltonian and then integrated against some other state m. So what this does of course is to the operation of this perturbed Hamiltonian on this unperturbed eigenfunction is to return a slightly modified function. Remember that h psi is only equal to e psi for the unperturbed Hamiltonian if you use the unperturbed eigenfunction. This is the perturbed Hamiltonian so this will therefore not be uh, an eigenfunction of this Hamiltonian. One will return a slightly modified function and then the integral of that against some other mth eigenstate of the unperturbed Hamiltonian will return some number giving the amount of overlap between this state and this now modified state. Of course, if this was the unperturbed Hamiltonian, this integral would be zero. So this then forms the coefficient that tells you how much of the nth state to mix in to the nth state. And it's weighted, note this, by a denominator that consists of the difference in energy between the eigenenergy for the nth state and the eigenenergy for the nth state. So not only does this overlap matter, but the energy difference between the eigenvalues of the various eigenstates of the unperturbed Hamiltonian. So you have a recipe here for calculating the perturbed energy and the perturbed wave function in terms of the unperturbed energies and wave functions of the Hamiltonian, knowing only the correction to the Hamiltonian required to describe the perturbation. With a look at a rather complicated subject uh, of which we will use just the result, which is time-dependent perturbation theory. The question addressed here is what is the probability of a transition occurring, uh, for example, between atomic states k and m, if at time t equals zero, we turn on some perturbation like a cosinusoidally oscillating electric field. The rather nasty looking uh, integral uh, expresses this uh, probability on the slide, but let's just go to the uh, simplified um, result for a uh, cosinusoidal perturbation shown in the next line of the slide. And this says that the probability uh, changes with time uh, as a product of two factors. The first factor is an overlap integral expressed in Dirac notation between the mth and the kth eigenstate of the unperturbed system as acted on by the perturbation Hamiltonian, so for example the electric field. So of course these states in the unperturbed system m and k are orthogonal and this integral would be zero, but with h the perturbation, perturbing Hamiltonian acting on psi k, uh, some number is returned that has an overlap with m, and so the extent of the overlap induced by the perturbation gives you the probability of the transition. The second factor is this delta function. It is the difference, uh, it's a delta function in the energy difference between the states and in this case the energy of the cosinusoidal perturbation and it states the uh, rather obvious conclusion that if the energy difference between these states here is exactly equal to the energy of the oscillating field that is applied, uh, there is a high probability of transition. This result is known as Fermi's Golden Rule. We'll use it again and again throughout the book. The equation at the bottom is a version of uh, Fermi's Golden Rule for states that are closely spaced in energy.